ideas. Where do they come from? It's such a popular question. Everybody goes to events and they they see their writer friends, the writers they've come to listen to. They're not friends. They're just people you showed up to listen to at a bookstore or at a auditorium or something. And somebody inevitably says, where do you get your ideas? And the answers are usually comedic or vapid or evasive. Comedic, vapid, comedic, vapid or evasive. That's not a bad little triptych there. Why? I think there are two reasons. One of them is because we have been deceived into accepting a false premise about where things come from. And the second reason is writers, like other artists, are defined by their mojo, our magic our ability to create something out of ostensibly nothing our self-worth our sense of identity our professional mystique our money seems to come from a public sense or something that says that we are different, only we can do what we do, and um, and we're going to venerate that somehow. We're going to celebrate it. We not, might not be celebrities like actors or musicians, because how could we possibly compete with them? But there is that sense. So, false premise, which I'm going to talk about, and we don't really want to answer your question because we like it this way, which is the other part of the thing. Let's do the, the first one first. Yeah, I'm having trouble today. The first one works like this. There are a bunch of areas in life where we talk about something out of nothing. One area is in theology, right? First, that's how the Bible begins, right? Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemaim ve et haaretz. Ve haaretz hait hatohu ve vohu ve choshech al pnei tachom. That's the Aramaic, right? In the beginning, the earth was unformed and void, and darkness was upon the face of the waters. There was nothing, apparently, except the waters. But there was nothing, and then there was something, and God created that. God is the first mover, right? The primary mover, and so. I don't know. Another area we have that is in psychology. Much later, we're talking 1800s here, and we have the notion of a tabula rasa, right? Which is Latin for tabula rasa. Just, we're going to have to deal with that. It needs to be less windy and stop blowing around the stuff that I have outside that's trying to block out the light. The notion that the mind is an empty thing and then it's filled with stuff over time. Part of the reason, not the only one, part of the reason why classrooms look the way they do. You have a bunch of empty vessels, and you have somebody at the front filling those empty vessels with information and knowledge. All right, I'm gonna pause it and fix this. I'm back. So in psychology, you have this idea of the mind is an empty thing. There's nothing, and then something's poured into it. Another area you see this is in political science and political philosophy. The, the world is in a state of anarchy, right? Chaos reigns. And then there's the struggle for order between or among nations. And there are other areas where we find, and then, sorry, and of course, creativity, creativity, right? Not just writing, but music, but any of the, the, the creative arts, which might be all of them, this notion that the artist 
uh, snatches form out of the void. So this notion of something out of nothing uh, permeates our culture. It's, it's, it's everywhere you look. There's some aspect of this. The problem is most of these are wrong. They're just, they're just wrong. I can't debunk the theology argument because it's non-falsifiable. All right, so it, let's shelve that one for a second. But with, um, with the tabula rasa argument, your mind is never empty. There's all, at, at the, the moment we are born, we have five senses, right? And stuff's, stuff's moving. And, pri and prior to that, during, during fetal development, there's, there's learning. I mean, when you come out of your mother, your arms and legs are flailing and you're crying and you can breathe and suck and do all kinds of various things. And the mind is not empty. There's no, there's no emptiness there. There's just something reposed upon something else. Political science, same thing. The notion of a state of actual anarchy where everybody is against everybody else is only a theoretical notion. There is no actual condition. There is, an, even in Hobbes, even of a war against all against all and all of that, there's never been such a condition. There's always been coalitions. There's always been alliances. There's always been relationships. There's always been family units and kindred systems and tribes. There's never been a state of anarchy from which order needs to be imposed. There have been systems that are more anarchic or less but there's never been a state of anarchy. And I would argue that in creativity, there's never a state, if you are an artist and if you're living your life as an artist, there is no point at which your mind is completely empty of ideas. It's going to feel that way. It's going to feel that way. You're going to be walking around trying to figure out what is my story? What is this thing about? What is this thing? What happens? I don't know. I don't know what to write. That's not the same thing. The act of wondering makes you receptive to answers. People without questions don't get answers. You've probably met some of these people. You might work for some of these people. We certainly elect some of these people. People without questions are not open to the possibility of answers. It doesn't matter if the answers are definitive. It doesn't matter if the answers are perfect. What matters is that there is a, a dialogue between the wonderment and the receptivity to new information and new ideas. If you are living the life of, of a writer. That is to say, forget all the external financial you've been published, haven't been published. I don't care about any of that right now. You are wondering about what to write. You're maybe in the midst of a, of a piece and you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what the next move is. You don't know what the right emotion is. You don't know what the next plot development is. You don't understand the emotional beats. It could be any number of things. There's all, all sorts of legitimate reasons to get stuck and to pause. But what's happening is that every creative act is reposed upon and anchored in previous ways of conceptualizing and ordering your other your thoughts, your own experiences. Your mind is always going to be working about this. You're going to be wondering now uh, about how to turn um, something that interests you into a problematic or a mystery. And I think that those two words are really, really very helpful. We, when we reject the premise that the creative act is the creation of something out of nothing, and instead recognize that it is some kind of conscientious negotiation with intentionality and a state of um, simply unformed uh, impressions, inspirations. I don't know. I haven't quite built up the theory for that yet. But there's something about, there's all that stuff going on around you. 
and there, but you need to you need to somehow turn that into order. I find that two things really harness most dramatic acts and most intellectual developments, and that is problems and mysteries. They are not the same thing. A mystery is what happened. Sometimes knowing what happened in the past tense makes it possible to move forward in time. Other times there are problems for which you do not have to solve the mystery. You can just solve the problem. For example, you're at a diner, it's 2 a.m., and you have not received your food in a very long time. You have a mystery. Where's my food? Or what happened to my food? Or when am I going to get my food? Although the last one's not quite the same. The problem is hungry want my food. Now, let's say you look over and there's your food underneath that hot lamp. You could stand, you'd break social conventions, but you can stand up, walk over, get your food, bring it back and insert it into your orifice. Problem solved. Not the mystery, though. You still have no idea why it wasn't able to make that journey itself, because the waitress is missing. Turns out, if you were to investigate it, the waitress is in the back on the phone having a crying breakup sob with her boyfriend, who is cheating on her with her sister as she works the late shift. Mystery solved. Now, here's the thing. You could have walked into the back to find the waitress, heard her on the phone, and solved that mystery, still not gotten your food it's still hungry so the problem can exist independent of the mystery sometimes solving the mystery is enough right the higgs boson particle is it real is it there that's a mystery it's not really a problem it might be a problem if you have to fulfill your grant but it's not really a problematic what it is it's a mystery that you want to solve uh, any mystery book contains a mystery in it by definitional fiat, right? Um, and you want to know what happened, right? It's an investigation into something that happened in the past in order to reach an understanding, right, that you didn't previously have, you know, the butler did it, you know, Mr. Mustard in the library with the rope. That's the mystery. And they're great fun because they're puzzles. There, there is an understanding that there is an answer out there waiting to be found. And if you proceed correctly, you'll get there. And the thing about mysteries is they promise resolution. Problems do not promise resolution. Uh, James Gardner in The Art of Fiction said that all stories come to end in one of two ways. Uh, either through resolution or logical exhaustion. All right, a lot of people out there, not to get political, but a lot of people are trying to understand the mind of Donald Trump. Well, I think that we already understand it. The problem is it's not a satisfying resolution. It's just logical exhaustion because he's like that. That's, that's his personality. That's how he rolls. In fact, He's remarkably consistent. He's what we call in literature a flat character, right? There is no, he's very easy to write. Any comedian, you know, any writer, any playwright with, with half a set of skills can write a perfectly convincing Donald Trump. It's just, he just lacks complexity. There's, n there's nothing you won't know. You can do the dialogue. You can do the intonations. You know what he's going to say next. You don't necessarily know what wild and wacky thing he's going to say next, but you know the, how it's basically going to play out. I'm not saying you can predict his words. I'm saying you can you can you can enact his character because he's a flat character. He's just not that 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 interesting. Um, he's interesting because he's influential and we need to understand him, but he's not an interesting character. So if you are looking at the world from mysteries and problems and recognize that 
um, your the thoughts that are on your mind at all times are going to start to inform the kinds of problems that you identify as a writer dramatically that you want to attend to or the kind of mysteries that you think are interesting to solve you can start to look out in the world and and find those the world Though, I mean, I, I know I keep using that phrase, so forgive me, but the world moving through your soul and coming out as writing is unique. There is n nobody else who is going to filter the world in quite the same way that you do. Whether you are good enough, whether other people want to engage what you've created, whether you're going to get paid for it and make a living at it, all that is is unknowable and part of my answer is just keep going because you don't know the answer doesn't exist yet it's not something to be discovered it's a future to be created but the fact is you go into a world a scenario a circumstance um, and what you personally get out of it is going to be distinct to your own life experiences, the resources that you have, the vocabulary that you have with which to explain it, the intellectual frameworks that you have with which to make sense of it, um, the, your capacity to articulate and describe, uh, all of that is gonna be unique to you, which is why, by the way, I know everybody's like, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna drop out of school and smoke some doobies and get laid and then write up my own experiences. And you know, that, that might get you through your first novella if it's 1962. But these days, that's not gonna do. You need to have more in your head in order to be able to formulate a universe that other people wanna spend time in. They're, people are spending time in your head. How interesting is your head? That's, that's sort of what it comes down to. And getting yourself an education is going to make your character broader and make it something worth dwelling inside. That's not a story, but you're going to have to tell a story in that way. So where do ideas come from? They come from you, but they come from your negotiation with the world around you, constantly trying to look out towards potential problematics that are worth solving, you know, find the girl, save the boy, you know, save this marriage, get laid. I don't care what it is, you know, try and buy that guitar. And then the various ways in which you're going to stymie those, that, that ambition for your protagonist what stories you create and how you weave those things together are going to be have distinct and unique dramatic force and effect. Uh, they're going to feel familiar to other endeavors, other writing endeavors, but don't worry about that. We'll talk about the worry and the paralysis uh, of, of being a writer in another session. But right now, recognize that th that bridge that you've been sold that things pop out of nowhere is false it's false every single moment that you're living an attentive life you are uh, uh you are gathering together potential source material but then what you need to do is inject it with imagination and love and heart and wonderment and boldness in order to transform the everyday into something estranged uh, so that you can bring something so familiar, a movie theater, a diner, a, uh, an airline flight, a long car drive with the family, the isolation of having to be, you know, here in Coronaville and and sitting by yourself in a room for long periods of time, but to bring that to life and make other people feel less alone in the world by something that you've created. So stop waiting for inspiration and stop wondering about the magic of where it comes from and go make some.
Uh, I know, easier said than done, but let's let's wrap it up there. Thank you.